Welcome everyone. Um, it's really nice to see everybody. Happy New Year. We can still say Happy New Year. It's not 31st yet. Um, it's lovely to see everybody here and it's such a treat um, to start off the new year with uh, uh, readings from Alicia. Um, so very nice to see you all. And um, I mean, for most of you, I know you don't need an introduction to Alicia, but I feel that I want to embarrass her a lot. And so I'm going to do it. Um, Alicia is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And in 2011, she was named a MacArthur Fellow, but that doesn't even cut the tiniest amount of her achievements. She is so many more things than these fellowships. She is a classicist, she is a Latinist, she is an award-winning, uh, critically acclaimed poet. Her work is widely published in the New Yorker, uh, Times Literary Supplement, and she has published nine books of poems and translation. Look, sure, she's, she, <laughs> she's not keeping count. <laughs> and uh, uh, her range is really breathtaking from the very beautiful, and if you haven't got it already, please get it, the uh, Frogs and the Mice, Mice and the Frogs, Frogs and the Mice. Frogs and, frogs and the mice. I knew I was going to when, fluff it when I, when I was there. Uh, okay, I have it at home and I wish my children were little again so that I could in, indulge with the beautiful uh, drawings in that book as well, not just the words that jump off the page too. Fabulous stuff. Um, so it ranges from the frogs and the mice to Hesiod's works and days. But actually, above all, it's Alicia's humanity and her observations on humanity and the way to connect her humanity that she has for everybody, not just through her poetry, but through everything that she does as well. She is a fabulous individual, and I'm so glad that she's starting off tonight with her new compilation of poetry, her selected poems, and uh, the uh, title of tonight's lecture is Readings, Postcards from Greece, Readings from Her Selected Poems, this afterlife. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you for that um, wonderful and touching um, introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here and to be doing an in-person and hybrid event. Um, at the British School, which is just one of my favorite places in Athens. I love this room. I have lots of wonderful memories of this place and the garden. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca um, uh, and Tanya and everyone at the school who's helped to make this event uh, work. Um, I think I met Rebecca at, um, I, I want to say, an irregular refugee um, shelter in Exarchia, <laughs> like where we were like, <laughs> um, you know, in, in jeans and, um, you know, passing out uh, activities to children. And um, one of the wonderful things about those times, I think, was um, all of the very interesting people I met, um, many of them here today. I mean, I didn't meet during that time, but we would interact, um, uh, you know, working in this sort of volunteer work, but the number of people who were archaeologists or professors or um, writers with these advanced degrees and sort of having these kind of intellectual conversations um, while also dealing with complete craziness. Um, so one of the things uh, with having a selected poems, it's a, it's a milestone. Um, you know, it, it feels, you know, like, okay, I'm getting older, I have a selected poems. Um, uh, but you, you look through your previous volumes, this includes poems from four volumes um, of work, and um, you hope that you pick the strong poems and, you know, it's time to like winnow out some of the weaker poems, perhaps. Um, but you also start to see patterns and themes and um, characters that recur and you get to think about it in a different way. Um, there was some debate on whether the selected poems would have a title or whether it would just be selected poems. Um, <laughs> and I really wanted it to have a title 
and I came up with several titles, which my editor did not want. And, um, and then at the last minute, I suggested this afterlife, which is a phrase at the end of the first poem of my first book. Um, and everyone, well, I don't know. I think I did a Twitter poll. Some people liked it. Some people thought it was um, morbid. But then, you know, I think that's a good indication of my poems, actually, they are difficult. Um, but I did abide by the poll, I believe, unlike some people with their Twitter polls. <laughs> um, and so, but I think it gave a sort of arc then looking at the book when I thought about naming it this afterlife and after this poem. So that the first poem um, really then does become a, a beginning poem um, to this poetic arc. Um, and it is based on a true story, although my husband um, disagrees with many of the particulars, to which I say, write your own sonnet. <laughs> <laughs> but you can discuss it with him afterwards if you like. And um, this predates my actually moving to Greece, um, but it is a postcard from Greece. And I, I think it happened on the island of Evia, I'm not sure, but we were, we were driving in the rain a postcard from Greece. Hatched from sleep as we slipped out of orbit round a clothespin curve, new watered with the rain, I saw the sea, the sky, as bright as pain, that outer space through which we were to plummet. No guardrails hemmed the road, no way to stop it. The only warning here and there, a shrine, some tended still, some antique and forgotten, empty of oil, but all were consecrated to those who lost their wild race with the road and sliced the tedious sea once like a knife. Somehow we struck an olive tree instead. Our car stopped on the cliff's brow. Suddenly safe, we clung together, shade to pagan shade, surprised by sunlight, air this afterlife. So this poem, you know, kind of written after this event, um, you know, then becomes in retrospect, a kind of introduction to, to all that follows. And I think it's been pointed out in, in some reviews like Ryan Ruby's review, he's like, and the olive tree recurs again and again and olive oil recurs again and again. And this is true, but you know, I think that's partly because I live in Greece. <laughs> But now it's the theme, it's the theme. <laughs> so the tree, the tree haunts, haunts the book, the tree that saved us. Um, among the characters who returns is Persephone. Um, and this is a very early poem. Persephone writes a letter to her mother, um, but she does come back in, in various guises. And again, this is another poem where it's been interesting to read what people write about the poem. Um, you know, because it does describe a, a hell that is very close to the surface of the world um, and these elements you'll hear at the beginning of the poem, but I was living in a basement apartment at the time. So I think part of it was just literally being at that level of walk, watching people's feet walk outside of your, of your window. First, Hell is not so far underground. My hair gets tangled in the roots of trees and I can just make out the crunch of footsteps, the pop of acorns falling or the chime of, shovel, of a shovel squaring a fresh grave or turning up the tulip bulbs for separation. Day and night, creatures with no legs or too many journey to hell and back. Alas, the burrowing animals have dim eyesight they are useless for news of the upper world. They say the light is loud. Their figures of speech all come from sound. Their hearing is acute. The dead are just as dull as you would imagine. They evolve like the burrowing animals, losing their sight. They may roam abroad sometimes, but just at night. They can only tell me if there was a moon. Again and again, moth-like, they are duped by any beckoning flame lamps and candles. They come back startled and singed, sucking their fingers happy the dirt is cool and dense and blind. They are silly and grateful and don't remember anything. 
I have tried to tell them stories, but they cannot attend. They pester you like children for the wrong details. How long were his fingernails? Did she wear shoes? How much did they eat for breakfast? What is snow? And then they pay no attention to the answers. My husband, bored with their babbling, neither listens nor speaks. But here there is no fodder for small talk. The weather is always the same. Nothing happens. Though at times I feel the trees rocking in place like grief, clenching the dirt with tortuous toes. There is nothing to eat here but raw beets and turnips. There is nothing to drink but mud-filtered rain. Of course, no one goes hungry or toils, however many. The dead breed like the bulbs of daffodils, without sex or seed, all underground, yet no race has such increase, worse than insects. I miss you and think about you often. Please send flowers. I am forgetting them. If I yank them down by the roots, they lose their petals and smell of compost. Though I try to describe their color and fragrance, no one here believes me. They think they are the same things as mushrooms, yet no dog is so loyal as the dead who have no wives or children and no lives, no motives, secret or bare to disobey. Plus my husband is a kind, kind master. He asks nothing of us, nothing, nothing at all. Thus fall changes to winter, winter to fall, while we learn idleness, a difficult lesson. He does not understand why I write letters. He says that you will never get them. True, mulched leaf paper sticks together, then rots, no ink but blood, and it turns brown like the leaves. He found my stash of letters where I had hid it, thinking he'd be angry, but he never angers. He took my, he took my hands in his hands, my shredded fingers, which I have sliced for ink, thin paper cuts. My effort is futile, he says, and doesn't forbid it. I think, um, so with the first book, Archaic Smile, it was published when I moved to Greece and we moved here in January of 1999, in the late 1900s, as my children say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the book, the poems in that book, uh, even though some of them are set in Greece, are not from when I lived in Greece, um, mostly, and that you know comes out more in in later books. Um, but maybe there are a couple of them that have this sense of having moved here and that being a different kind of situation. Um, so this is one about Medea, um, another blonde from Georgia, as I like to say. <laughs> Medea homesick. How many gifted witches, young and fair, have flunked, been ordinary, left the back stooping study of their art, black and white for love, that sudden foreigner. Because chalk fingered wisdom streaks the hair, because the flame that flaps upon its wick rubrics the eye, I have left behind the book and washed my hands of ink, my homeland, my father. But beauty doesn't travel well. The ocean, sun-strong years, the charms I knew by rote, irregular as verbs, decline to charm. I cannot spell the simplest old potion I learned for love. As for the antidote, he discovered it himself and is past harm. Um, so with my second book, Hapex, and I, I think the title also um, obviously reflected my, my living here in some ways. Um, it's this totally Greek word, H-A-P-A-X. Um, and I remember talking with my editors and they were saying, what is this? And why do you want to title your book this way? I think I was pregnant at the time and hormonal and I was like, it will be this. And I said, but it's gonna look so cool. Cause like there's like an H and an A and a P and an A and an X. And it's gonna look really cool on the title and um, people will be curious about it. I don't know if that's true, but, but I stuck with it. Um, and the first poem of that too also is as with the car accident of the of Archaic Smile, the first poem in Hapex is about 
the earthquake of, of 99 when we moved here, um, which was a, an interesting welcome for people from the East Coast of America who are not used to earthquakes. And I remember, you know, two weeks before that, there was a huge earthquake in Istanbul and I was watching all these terrible things on CNN and turning to my husband, I said, you know, but will this happen here? Could this happen here? He's like, it will happen. <laughs> it's, not, it's not helping. Of course, you know, hopefully better building codes. But anyway, it was, it was very frightening when it happened. Aftershocks. We are not in the same place after all. The only evidence of the disaster mapping out across the bedroom wall, tiny cracks still fissuring the plaster, a new cartography for us to master, in whose legend we read where we are bound, terra infirma, a stranger land and vaster, or have we always stood on shaky ground? The moment keeps on happening, a sound, the floor beneath us swings, a pendulum that clocks the heart, the heart so tightly wound, we fall mute as when two lovers come to the brink of the apology and halt, each standing on the wrong side of the fault. So I think another thing that started happening after living in Greece for a bit, and um, you know, I'd studied ancient Greek, how much that helps with studying modern Greek, not a lot, it helps with spelling, helps a lot with spelling. Um, but this, I think kind of experience of if you have spent some time studying ancient languages and you're walking around and this alphabet is all around you and you are listening to the idioms in the language and um, I think you're feeling very childlike, you know, at the strangeness of the idioms in a foreign language. So for a poet, it's a great boon, I think, to suddenly be somewhere else um, because you're kind of put back in that childlike language acquisition. And um, one of the things that really struck me um, when I was trying to learn Greek, um, I won't say I've learned it, I'm trying all the time, but, um, you know, by people just saying, you know, either, and Elfia Altis, you know, you're just like, this is the modern Greek for nightmares, Elfia Altis. Um, and for people who have studied ancient Greek history and so forth, this is a shock. The modern Greek for nightmare is Elfia Altis. Um, and of course, there is this sense of Elfia Altis being this titan of ancient kind of nightmare, but it's impossible not to think of the traitor who leads the Persians around the pass at Thermopylae. The modern Greek for nightmare is Ephialtis. I think what brought you to this pass? Heroes lie thick, anonymous, blurred with honorable mention in mass graves of fine intention. And yet even now dreams yield on their unequal battlefield, betrayals still familiar face, the name that nothing can erase, not even final victory. Sleep has no sense of history. Even now I lose the day, always look the other way, while old treachery awaits the heart's warm springs, its hot gates. So for me, I think that poem is something that exists somewhere between English and Greek, that it's kind of trying to have, have its cake and eat it too with um, various puns. This is a, a poem again from kind of having lived in Greece for a few years and feeling maybe a little bit more at home, but even now that's a long time ago now. Um, Buzuki. It's kind of, as I'm reading a lot of the poems, sometimes after five years here, after 10 years here, and you know, you can, you can continue to do the math. Buzuki. After five years here, I understand most of the sung words, recognize the tune, but there's an element I'll never get that isn't born in me. The way they play, one manages to hold his cigarette between two fingers on his strumming hand, takes drags between his solos. And then soon how something changes, a woman starts to sway around an absent center, ancient wrongs cherished. The cigarette gives up its ghost. 
The music drives now, someone makes a toast and suddenly the melody arrives at minor, Asia minor, in whose songs the hands of lovers always rhyme with knives. Which word's in Greek? The, um, the third collection that these are taken from is called Olives. I think my editors were relieved. <laughs> it's like, that's a word we know and understand. Um, <laughs> uh, although I, have, I had two poems about olives in that book, and one of them is, is this poem here, which comes from uh, a weekend of actually gathering olives um, down in Sparta with the, the American poet Mark Sargent. Um, and there's a second poem that ended up being on the back of the book where I just, I love the word olives in English because it contains so many other words, you know, oh, lives. Um, so I'll read you the, the sort of more literal poem here, olives. Sometimes a craving comes for salt, not sweet, for fruits that you can eat only if pickled in a vat of tears a rich and dark and indehiscent meat clinging tightly to the pit on spears of toothpicks maybe, drowned beneath a tide of vodka and vermouth, rocking at the bottom of a wide, shallow, long-stemmed glass and gentrified or rustic on a plate cracked like a tooth, a miscellany of the humble hues eponymously drab brown greens and purple browns, the blacks and blues that chart the slow chromatics of a bruise washed down with swigs of barrel wine that stab the palate with pine sharpness. They recall the harvest and its toil, the nets spread under silver trees that foil the blue glass of the heavens in the fall, daylight packed in treasuries of oil, paradigmatic summers that decline like singular archaic nouns, the troops of ours in retreat. These fruits are mine, small bitter droops, full of the golden past and cured in brine. And find the second one. Um, so as a sort of bonus, and the selected poems also have some bonuses. One of the things that I had discussed with the editor is whether it was gonna be a new and selected, and my editor was very against that um, for whatever reason. I mean, I guess there are some times where you have a new and selected poems where maybe the new poems don't hold up. So <laughs> you wanna avoid that obviously, but um, I think the other idea would be like holding off new poems for a new book. But I did want people to get something extra if they had the other four books. So we added um, some poems that I ended up not collecting in the four books, but which I later kind of regretted. Sometimes, you know, you put a poem in a book and you think, ah, oh, maybe I shouldn't have put that in there. But later you think, oh, maybe I should have put this one in there. Um, so there's a little segment of extra poems. Um, and in a way, Olives is extra because it just existed on the back page, the back of this one book. So this again is, the title is Olives, but here every line is a rearrangement either of the letters of Olives or because I'm the poet and I can change the rules as I'm going along, um, just the sounds of those. Um, so I have both of those things going. So maybe you'll hear them as they're moving around, Olives. Is love so evil? Is Eve low, love vies, evolves. I lose selves, sylphs of loose Levi's, sieve oil of vile slow. Love sighs, slives, oh, veils of wall, so sly, so suave. Oh, lives, soil, sleeves, I love, so I solve. I realized like after that poem had kind of set, I kind of feel with poems a little bit like a potter. Poets and potters have much in common as Hesiod will tell us, mostly that they envy each other. I mean, <laughs> poets envy poets and potters envy potters. I have been introduced as an award-winning potter. 
Um, <laughs> Um, but I sort of feel with, with poems, you know, they're a bit like clay and for a while you can do anything with them and you, but after, then after a while they kind of set and you have to kind of leave them alone. And I realized that there was a perfect anagram of olives that I had not included in that poem, but it was too late to get it in. So I feel like it's the ghost line of that poem, which as you have figured out is, oh, Elvis. <laughs> One of the nice things about reading um, some of the poems in Athens is I don't have to explain the setting to you. <laughs> it's just going to be obvious um, what certain things are. This was from many years ago when um, there was a wonderful lunar eclipse. And this poem is called Sublunary, a wonderful English word for all that is beneath the moon. Sublunary. Mid sentence. We remembered the eclipse, arguing home through our scant patch of park, still warm with barrel wine, when none too soon we checked the hour by glancing at the moon, unfazed at first by that old ruined marble looming like a monument over the hill, so brimmed with light it seemed about to spill. Then there, we watched the thin edge disappear. The obvious, stole over us like awe, that it was our own silhouette we saw, slow perhaps to us moon gazing here, reaching for each other's fingertips, but sweeping like a wing across that stark alien surface at the speed of dark. The crickets stirred from winter sleep to warble something out of time, confused and brief. The roosting birds sang out in disbelief. The neighborhood's stray dogs began to bark and then the moon was gone. And in its place, a dim red planet hung just out of reach, as real as a bitter orange or ripened peach in the penumbra of a tree. At last, we rose and strolled at a reflective pace past the taverna crammed with light and smoke and people drinking, laughing at a joke, unaware that anything had passed outside in the night where we delayed, sheltering in the shadow we had made. It's also been pointed out there, there are a lot of poems about marital arguments, um, <laughs> uh, which uh, I realized that in a way, I think strife is kind of my muse and um, Hopefully I'm not getting into marital arguments in order to get poems out of them. <laughs> that would be bad. But I think what happens is that um, after a kind of quarrel or something, you are kind of thrown into a kind of inward and reflective um, sort of thing. So at least you can apologize by writing poems for people. Um, so this is one of these. On visiting a borrowed country house in Arcadia for John. To leave the city always takes a quarrel. Without warning, rankers that have gathered half the morning like things to pack or a migraine or a cloud are suddenly allowed to strike. They strike the same place twice. We start by straining to be nice, then say something shitty. <laughs> Isn't it funny how it's what has to happen to make the unseen ivory gates swing open, the right we must perform so we can leave? Always we must grieve our botched happiness. We goad each other till we pull to the hard shoulder of the road, yielding to tears inadequate as money. But if instead of turning back, we drive into the day, we forget the things we didn't say. The silence fills with row on row of vines or olive trees. The radio hums to itself. We make our way between Saronic blue and hills of glaucous green and thread beyond the legend of the map through footnote towns along the coast that boast ruins of no account, a column more woebegone than solemn men watching soccer at the two cafes and half built lots where dingy sheep still graze. Climbing into the lap, 
of the mountains now, we wind around blind centrifugal turns. The sun's great warship sinks and burns. And where the roads without a sign are crossed, we inevitably get lost. <laughs> Yet to be lost here still feels like being somewhere. And we will find when we arrive and park, no one minds that we are late. There is no one to wait, only a bed to make, a suitcase to unpack. The earth has turned her back on one yellow middling star to consider lights more various and far. The shaggy mountains hulk into the dark or loom like slow titanic waves. The cries of owls dilate the shadows. Weird harmonics rise from the valley's distant glow where coal extracted from the lignite mines must roll on acres of conveyor belts that sing the Pythagorean music of a string. A huge gray plume of smoke or steam towers like the ghost of a monstrous flame or giant tree among the trees. And it is all the same, the power plant, the forest and the night, the man-made light. We are engulfed in an immense ancient indifference that does not sleep or dream. Call it nature if you will, though everything that is, is natural the lignite bearing earth, the factory, a darkness taller than the sky, this out of doors that wins us our release and temporary peace, not because it is pristine or pretty, but because it has no pity or self pity. One of the things for people following along, um, I write almost exclusively in received forms. So um, in stanza patterns, I often have rhyme, um, sometimes syllable count or metrics. Um, the stanzas in that are sort of modified versions of Kavafi's stanza pattern for the city, um, which is a poem you know that I love, but I'm very intrigued with the rhyme scheme, which is like A, B, B, C, C, D, D, A, and that feeling of not quite escaping even as you're moving forward. Um, so as we get towards um, like, uh, which <laughs> again, at least it's a short and easy title. Um, this is my um, most recent collection of new poems um, and these all written while living in Greece, and I think are um, some of the figures that you see before Persephone and so on kind of return, um, but they do so perhaps with with more experience of, of having lived in this country. And um, this book of poems, um, I arranged in a completely different way from the way I had arranged other books of poems. Usually a book of poems is arranged in sections, four or five sections that might have thematic unities, sort of like movements in a symphony. But um, this book of poems, like I decided to just put everything in alphabetical order. And um, it was amazing to me how the poems did fall out in ways that, that worked and they seem to be in conversation with each other. It also makes them much easier to find in a reading. <laughs> I don't have to look at the table of contents. Um, very, very occasionally there was a poem um, that did not fit where it was slotted to in the alphabet. And in those rare cases, I changed the titles <laughs> because I'm the poet and I can do any of these things. Um, again, I don't know why, but it seems like the first poem in almost all of the books has something to do with um, a different phase of living in Greece, I guess. And this one is, is the same. This is a so if you think about um, how uh, that car crash or that earthquake, this one is called After Greek Proverb. For those of you who are following along, it's a villanelle if that's on your bingo card. So it'll be 19 lines long and it will have two rhyme sounds that'll kind of waltz around each other. And it will have two lines that repeat, waltz around each other and kind of meet up at the end. Um, this was the first book, the first poem in this most recent book, and it has um, some Greek in it right off the bat. So that at least got to freak the editors out that they had to put in some Greek. Um, 
I do not translate that usually, even the readings, because you'll hear it come around again and again and again. And I, I, again, you'll, you'll hear how much longer we've lived in Greece in the poem. That's one of these indicators <laughs> after a Greek proverb. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. Just for a couple of years, we said, a dozen years back. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. We dine sitting on folding chairs. They were cheap, but cheery. We've taped the broken window pane, TV still out of whack. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. When we cross the water, we only brought what we could carry, but there are always boxes that you never do unpack. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Sometimes when I'm feeling weepy, you propose a theory. Nostalgia and tear gas have the same acrid smack. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. We stash bones in the closet when we don't have time to bury. Stuff receipts in envelopes, file papers in a stack. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. 12 years now, and we are still eating off the ordinary. We left our wedding china behind, afraid that it might crack. We're here for the time being, we answer to the query, but nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Um, and again, it's e much easier to find the poems in this one. Um, so <laughs> uh, this was this last book of poems like also covered that kind of very intense period, um, which was both very dramatic um, uh, with lots of refugees coming into Athens, but I also kind of look upon with some fondness just because of the wonderful relationships I had with fellow volunteers and just the ability to simply go out once a week and help someone, um, I think was a great antidote to this feeling of helplessness that we often have um, with the world around us seeming to get worse and worse. And you know what a privilege it was in those days to be able to at least help somebody, you know, even if it's, <laughs> if our, ourselves perhaps um, um, once a week and having a coffee afterwards. Um, but it was also obviously very dramatic time. My children were much younger around 2015 and 2016, work out the math. Um, and I was involved with a lot of Facebook groups that were helping or were involved in um, volunteering. But that also meant, you know, there's the very famous image of the child who drowned and you know, motivated lots of people to become involved. But I was seeing many more images like that. And in you know, children dressed the same way I would have dressed my children in the morning. I remember one time after putting my children on the bus, coming back to finding, I think around 40 people in two separate incidents around the island of Lesbos had drowned and 17 of those being children and just thinking that's like a, school bus full of children. And then how do you write about that? I think that as a writer, that's kind of difficult question because you do not want to be exploiting other people's experience in some way to you know, aggrandize yourself. And um, I went about writing about it in some ways, but part of that was I thought I have to analyze my own response first, I think. So this poem is called Empathy. And of course, um, Empathy has a, a different, different meaning in Greek. Um, so, empathy. My love, I'm grateful tonight. Our listing bed isn't a raft, precariously adrift as we dodge the Coast Guard light and clasp hold of a girl and a boy. I'm glad we didn't wake our kids in the thin hours to take not a thing, not a favorite, toy and didn't hand over our cash to one of the smuggling rackets, that we didn't buy cheap life jackets, no better than bright orange trash and less buoyant. I'm glad that the dark above us is not deeply twinned beneath us and moiled with wind, and we don't scan the sky for a mark, any mark that demarcates a shore as the dinghy starts taking on water. I'm glad that our six-year-old daughter who can't swim is a foot off the floor in the bottom bunk and our son with his broken arms high and dry, that the ceiling is not seeping sky with our journey but hardly begun. Empathy isn't generous. 
It's selfish. It's not being nice to say I would pay any price not to be those who die to be us. Um, since my daughter Atalanta is here, but I think not in the room, I think I can read a poem for her. Because <laughs> she now is 13. <laughs> One of these things I predicted in this poem. Um, some of you all were at her quite dramatic baptism. <laughs> her godmother is here. Um, for Atalanta. Your name is long and difficult, I know. So many people whom we didn't ask have told us so <laughs> and taken us to task. You too perhaps will wonder as you grow and blame us with the venom of 13 for ruining your life, using our own love against us keen as a double-bladed knife. Already I can picture the whole scene. How will we answer you? Yes, you were in a hurry to arrive as if it were a race to be alive. We weighed the syllables and they rang true and we were hoping too you'd come to like the stories of princesses who weren't set on shelves like China figurines, not allegories, but girls whose glories included rescuing themselves, slaying their own monsters, running free, but not running away. It might be rough, singled out for singularity, tough. Beauty will be of some help, you'll see, but it is not enough to be nimble, brave, or fleet, O oh, apple of my eye. The world will drop many gilded baubles at your feet to break your stride. Don't look down, don't stoop to scoop them up. Don't stop. So you can tell her about that thing. <laughs> Maybe eventually they like hearing the poems about them again. I don't know, maybe it, it changes. Um, I'll read two or three more. How are we doing? Our... Um, so I did add some extra poems. Maybe I'll read one of those and a translation. Um, so this is one of these poems that somehow didn't make it into an earlier collection. And then I looked at it and I thought, you know, maybe it, it works here. And I think it's a kind of nice framing perhaps with the, with the opening sonnet of the poem, of the, of the book, um, which is about this car crash. This is learning to read Greek. And um, this is for the, the people learning classical Greek, I guess, but it's, it's about all the Greeks. I think of Greek now as a, as a continuum rather than than different Greeks, learning to read Greek. As though a host of diacritical marks swooped over the rough breathing of the sea, the swallows parse the brightness in dark arcs, glossing the infinitive to be. Hexameters drum surging to the shore, spondaic at the end with their long vowels. The sea gleams like a shield washed clean of gore, and as lights now declined, the little owls pipe from the needled forest, each to each in dialect about times take and give, the aorist now forever out of reach and how the moon is chased and has been wronged and speak of sorrow in the genitive as if it were to her, the world belonged. One of the things I have added to this um, is there are a few translations at the very end, um, but these are translations of modern Greek poets that are themselves pieces of classical reception. So I think they kind of feed in to the general ethos. This one is a George Seferis poem. It's called Upon a Line of Foreign Verse. So it is itself kind of about translation. He takes this one line of a Dubaye sonnet. Um, uh, but again, it's, it's a, I, I love that it's about modern Greece and ancient Greece and modern Greek and ancient Greek. And my version is in, in English. <laughs> um, so he starts with this line, happy is he who has made the journey of Odysseus. Happy if as the journey loomed, he felt the sturdy rigging of a love stretched taut inside his body like the veins where the blood boomed of a love with unbroken rhythm invincible as music and undying, because it was born when we were born and whether it dies when we do, we do not know, and it is no use trying. 
God help me to say in a moment of great joy, what is this love? I sit sometimes surrounded by an alien land and I hear its distant roar like the bottom of the sea mingled with an inexplicable whirlwind from above. And again and again, the shade of Odysseus appears before me with eyes red from the brine of the waves and from a ripe yearning to see once more the smoke wafting from the warmth of his house and the dog grown old waiting at the door. There he stands tall, whispering through his whitened beard words of our tongue as it was spoken 3000 years ago. He holds out a palm calloused from the ropes and the tiller with skin weathered by the dry north wind, by the scorching heat and the snow. It's as though he wants to banish from our midst the superhuman cyclops who watched with one eye, the sirens whose songs make you forget, and Scylla and Charybdis who swallow you whole. So many elaborate monsters that keep us from reflecting how he was a man who strove in the world with his body and his soul. He is the great Odysseus, the one who directed them to build the wooden horse and the Achaeans won Troy. I imagine he is coming to tell me how to build a wooden horse so I may win my own Troy. Because he speaks humbly and serenely without effort, he seems to know me like a father or like the old mariners who leaning on their nets at the hour of winter and the wind's anger would sing to me in my childhood the song of Eratocritus with their eyes full of tears and in my sleep, still thinking of the unjust fate of Arite descending the marble staircase, I was seized with fears. He tells me how hard the pain is to feel the sails of your ship belly with memory and your soul become the helm, to be alone and rudderless as chaff on the threshing floor when the shadows overwhelm, the bitterness of seeing your companions sunk into the elements, scattered one by one, and how strange it is to become a man by speaking with the dead when the living who remain are no longer sufficient unto you, none. He speaks, I still see his hands that knew how to test if the mermaid on the prow was well carven without splinter, giving me the unruffled blue sea in the heart of winter. <laughs> I'm going to make you come back here. Alicia, thank you so, so much. That was fantastic. And um, I just, uh, first of all, it went by so quickly that uh, we'd like you to stay for another three hours and just read poetry, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, but hugely evocative. I mean, just the words, um, that tingling feeling of recognition that you get when you, when you understand what you're saying. I mean, even the first one, which, you know, are, are causing an argument. I mean, I don't know if I recognized it because I have those kinds of arguments with Brad all the time or if it was, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Your, your warmth and, and as I said, humanity is just jumping off the page. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> Alicia has a uh, very uh, kindly um, offered to take some questions and we have uh, uh, questions that people are welcome to uh, ask online and I think Yorgos has uh, put something in the chat to, to say where people can do that and uh, we can take questions from the floor so I'll uh, let you go back in there Alicia. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, there's some downstairs, there, there's some books downstairs. So. I, I will be very happy to sign them. Great guys. <laughs> I have a question about um, well, this is a question you answered before, but maybe not for this audience. Um, in the past, you know, you, you've been labeled a formalist poet in the States, and it's that, that word that immediately brings up associations. And I'm just curious, as an American poet, how you, where if you know, a large part of American contemporary poets are not writing in forms. Uh, do you feel connected to those, to your contemporaries in the U.S. as a writer, or do you feel like some sort of alien? How do you feel about, well, we know you feel like an alien, but how do you feel about the term? The term? Uh, well, I think no, no poet likes anything that ends in like an ist or an yeah. ism, you know, there is, you know, you feel like, oh, that's not me, I'm not part of a school or whatever. Um, in fact, I was for a while doing a, a blog with some other 
uh, poet critics for the Poetry Foundation, and this came up. And I was like, no, everyone fights over the term of who it gets to be in the avant-garde, but nobody wants to be a new formalist. <laughs> Um, I think I feel that, you know, I'm an old formalist, like there's nothing new about it. And I'm just, I feel connected to, um, you know, poets like Richard Wilbur and Anthony Hecht, but also I feel like in the UK, this was just never as much of an issue. And I feel a little bit like I, I mean, I don't like belong in the UK exactly, but I feel a, a connection across the, across the water too. Um, I feel, just feel like in the UK, it was just less of a a break where it suddenly you can't rhyme anymore. You know, there was all there were always people who are doing it. Um, you know, and I sometimes write poems that you know don't rhyme or whatever, but they tend not to be as good. So um, they I collect the ones that I feel work better. <laughs> okay. I, I was just thinking that uh, many uh, poems that I've read that don't have any elements of the formalist, if I can use an IST. Uh, in that, it's more like reading prose. Oh, I think it's it can be trickier. I mean, you know, the I think the free verse line is is a you have to have a lot of control to do that. I mean, people talk about line breaks. I see. I don't feel like lines break. I feel I feel syntax breaks over lines. I don't think line breaks are a thing. But that's just maybe me. And the same vowel sounds repeated in poems, which give them a special musicality. When you write the poems, does this come naturally as you write it, or do you sometimes add that dimension afterwards? I mean, how? Well, that's the question. I think some of it comes quite naturally, you know, sometimes a line just kind of percolates into your head and it's memorable to, rem memorable to you because it has some kind of musical or rhythmic element. Um, but I think as you, maybe also as you mature as a poet, you can get a little better at the revision part. I think maybe you're sort of allotted a certain amount of talent, but um, there are some things that I think you can definitely improve with age. And I think one of those things is, is revision where you take something that you see that is maybe not conscious in the work. And then you think, what happens if I kind of reinforce that consciously? So, um, you know, I think it's a little bit of, of both things. I do like to speak my poems aloud. So I think um, that is just an element where, you know, you want to have what Keats calls a vowel music and, and I enjoy, you know, rhythmic lines. We enjoy them too. <laughs> <laughs> You're, is there a question online? Uh, yes. Question is, if you could expand on why you particularly like Cavafos poem in the city. Um, well, I think it's, you know, it, he is one of the great poets and that is one of his very great poems. Um, I, as a poet, I'm intrigued with it partly because I think sometimes in translations into English, one is not aware of the rather intense rhyme scheme that is happening in the Greek. I mean, and it's, it's even beyond kind of regular rhymes. Um, some of them are rhyme riche where it's actually homonyms and things are, and it feels more claustrophobic. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not a native Greek speaker, but my, my sense is it feels more claustrophobic in Greek. And I was kind of interested in a poem that starts off talking about leaving the city I, I felt I wanted to kind of do this nod to, to what it takes to leave or not leave the city. I'm not sure that answered the question, but. <laughs> uh, um, first of all, to say how beautiful that was, and really so beautifully read as well. But also to ask, because a lot of your poems are linking your staying in Athens and linking that to your interest in ancient Greece, I was just wondering if you, had just come for the short time, as you described in one poem, and you've gone back. Do you think the content would have been different? And obviously, you were, are and were interested in the ancient, but that mix that's so particularly yours about the everyday. I think it probably would have been different. I mean, I, I do also think of myself as a, a Southern poet from the Southern US, and there's 
there's more of that in the first book and that kind of some of that drops off. I think, you know, there's some kudzu and, and things like that. Um, you know, I do respond very much to what I am surrounded by. And I think being also being in Greece in very interesting times, um, you know, my husband's a journalist, so um, that was, it was good for us in a sense, but um, having this feeling of being on, on the front line of a lot of things that are happening in the larger world um, did, I think, affect my sense of like, how do you write about that when it's happening all around you? I think part of that is that I wrote more prose. I, I write actually quite a lot of prose about life in Athens and wonder like, can I get that into a poem? But I think if you look at poems of mine that are about Greek mythology from before I live in Athens, they're much more direct, I think. And there maybe is even more free reign of imagination. And I think there's, there's more of an awareness of the diachronic levels here. So I think it becomes more mediated for good or for ill um, by living here. You know, having your daughter be friends with a Xenophon or, or Antigone or whatever, it, it just, it's a different kind of feeling. Is there another one online? Is um, say, I assume the decision to move to Greece was your own. How does this do a <laughs> poet writing in English? Uh, and I do not mean you should write in Greek. <laughs> oh, well, I, you know, I couldn't write in Greek. I mean, uh, they, I mean, I could maybe with great effort translate something into Greek and then have it corrected. Um, <laughs> I think you do have to write in your, your kind of mother tongue. Um, it, you know, I, my husband and I decided to try it out for a couple of years and then things happen and now we have kids and you know it's nothing is more permanent than temporary so I'm not sure how how conscious it is I guess it's conscious in the fact that we haven't moved back or you know um I I do find it you know infinitely I think Athens is just an infinitely interesting place and and Greece is an infinitely interesting place and um it has certainly changed my my maybe more of myself as a classicist, I look at classical texts very differently living here and just the geography. And um, I think about class and, and seeing huge migrations of people over the Eastern Aegean and just realizing, you know, this has been going on since, you know, before human beings almost. Um, so I think that has been one of the effects, but I'm not, I'm not sure how conscious exactly being here is. It wasn't like I said, I'm writing about Greece and I'm gonna to move to Greece. But at the same time, um, there's maybe a virtuous circle or maybe it's over-determined. You know, I studied, originally studied classics in Athens, Georgia. I was just determined to live in, in Athens. Um, maybe it's no accident, so, you know, that I ended up falling in love with a Greek man. And, you know, so maybe it is more conscious than I give it credit for. Devin? I was intrigued by what you were saying during the meeting about um, going through your body of work because these four books and poems and all that seem to um, sustain points of interest and um, things that you would return to. And I guess I was wondering, did you see it all as a change in your relationship to form as you were going through? <clears throat> The, there may be. I mean, I think if anything, they, the poems tend to get kind of more formal. There was more free verse in the first book. Um, I don't know, again, whether that is good or ill. Um, I'm I, it, Actually, in the selections of poems, I, I did kind of weight poems that didn't rhyme slightly more because I felt like they needed to be in there as a sort of break from all the rhyming. Um, you know, sometimes you see things and you think, oh, gosh, I use this image a lot or it, even individual words, I mean, it's, that sometimes just happens during copy editing, editing. With my book, Like, I realized I had the word cyclopean like five times. <laughs> I mean, that's an odd word to have over and over again. I mean, each time it had a reason for being there. But, um, you know, eventually I was like, okay, this is some sort of weird obsession of mine. Um, and it's been very interesting to read reviews. I mean, I'm very um, grateful to be reviewed at all. I know that that's to have poetry reviewed at all is, is, something to be grateful for, but people picking up on things like the symbolism of the olive tree and the olive oil and you think, well, but it's just around, but you know, maybe it is, maybe it is like the symbol. Um, and there are characters of mine um, that 
kind of get older as I get older. You know, there's a there's a late poem about Daphne that I think has a very different attitude to her situation to a very young Daphne. Um, so that's been kind of interesting to see. something like an accident happens you think this is you know after you get over the accident you think oh i'm gonna write this down it, it's written on me not can a restaurant and then it's thrown into a box and then you pick it up later or how is how are the thoughts on the form like how are they I think there are probably five or six different ways that they tend to happen with me. Like sometimes it might happen exactly like you describe. Sometimes I might, it might be like Tuesday and I think to myself, I am going to make time to write something creative today and I'm going to give myself an exercise and I'm just going to try to write a sonnet because that's a default form. And I, it may be terrible, um, but then maybe there's something in there that can be saved. Sometimes it is a line or an image. Um, I am also very taken with wordplay. So sometimes, it, you know, a pun suddenly seems very deep to me. Um, and, you know, sometimes there are poems that start out in a certain form. And then other times there are poems that I have written in 17 different forms and it never really worked. And I keep trying new things. So I think there's not a formula. If there were a formula, then they would become formulaic. I think that's 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 a, a danger. Um, and I think it gets harder as I get older because you have to keep reinventing this newness of yourself with the page. And you can't really rely on things that have worked in the past because that will be exactly what will not work. So um, maybe it's easy to stumble on things accidentally as a younger poet, and it's harder to trick yourself into stumbling upon things as an older poet. I'm not sure. Very nice. Any other questions? Um, Alicia, thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me.